Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Sigmetrics tutorial on coupling techniques for complex control problems. Um, so my name is Eve, and, um, and Sid and I are today going to tell you about basically all sorts of different, uh, different techniques that have been used in Sigmetrics and the Sigmetrics community and beyond to solve a variety of kind of difficult problems. Um, all to do with various types of complex systems. So the world is full of complex systems. You know, I don't really need to tell all of you in this room kind of how complicated the world is if you try to model it mathematically. Um, you've got, you know, whether you're talking about epidemics or inventory management, um, ride sharing, um, queuing systems of, of various types, all of these, you know, are complex systems that are really difficult to analyze exactly mathematically. And so, what I'm going to tell you about uh, today in this tutorial is a basically way of analyzing a variety of complex systems by basically, um, instead of directly attacking the complex system, by attacking a much easier system instead. And we're going to call this kind of general way of thinking about complex systems coupling. It's a way to analyze complex systems by working instead with related easy systems. So I'm going to start by kind of giving a high-level overview of what coupling is in this talk. So um, you may have heard of like coupling and stochastic processes before. Um, that's kind of going to be a, you know, that's going to be a kind of part of what we're talking about, but we're going to take an even slightly more broader view. So, so what is coupling? So coupling is basically if you if you've got some complex system that you're trying to answer a question about. And maybe your system is complex enough that you're okay with a complex answer. You're okay with an approximate answer. So um, coupling is when it's really difficult to attack this question directly. So instead of attacking it directly, you go via an easy system. And couplings have like the following ingredients. We first um, basically uh, give this complex system and this easy system, we kind of make sure they have something in common. And that usually looks something like the same random input. So if x is some stochastic process and y is some stochastic process, there will be kind of the same random outcomes of the random variables behind both stochastic processes or something like that. And hopefully y, hopefully you've chosen some system y that's easy enough that you can answer the question. And then the kind of the big idea in coupling is to show that your systems are similar enough, is to choose a system y that's similar enough such that when you give the system the same random input, you end up with similar answers to your question, which means that rather than having to directly answer the question for x, you can say, well, it's similar to the answer I got for y. So let me give a concrete example. Um, so, so this example is going to be about analyzing a honestly not very complex system, the MMKQ. Uh, but this is just an illustrative example. So the MMKQ is a kind of multi-server queuing system. And let's say we're trying to figure out the mean number of jobs in an MMKQ. Um, so, you know, this particular question is an exercise in textbooks, but for illustrative purposes, I'm going to give a simple bound using coupling. And so, if I've got an MMKQ, what easy system might I compare it with? I'm going to compare it to an MM1. And specifically, I'm going to compare it to an MM1 with the same total service capacity. So, I'm going to, on the left, I'm going to look at a complex system where I've got K servers, each of speed mu over K. And then my single server will have speed mu. So the same, so both of these systems, they're kind of similar in the sense that they both have the same total service capacity. But the MM1 is obviously an easier system because it's kind of um, because we don't have to worry about, you know, are all the servers full or are only some of them full, some of them empty. And so the way we're gonna um, the way we're gonna give the same random input to these systems is by giving them the same arrival process and the same, what I like to call, potential departure process. So um, the arrival process is just a Poisson process of rate lambda. At, and when at, at, uh, this is the process by which jobs arrive. Then a potential departure process is a Poisson process of rate mu. which And whenever uh, the, a, a potential departure occurs, in the MM1, a departure occurs if there are any jobs. In the MMK, a departure occurs with probability proportional to the fraction of busy servers. So for example, if only one server is busy in the MMK and a potential departure occurs, then we'll have a departure with probability 1 over k. Um, 
which you can confirm is exactly the right dynamics for the MMK, right? If there's one job, then there should be departures at rate u over k. So the, so the kind of key idea uh, with, with this coupling argument is that we're going to give the exact same Poisson processes for the arrivals and potential departures to both of these systems. So now, so, OK, so that's our kind of first step of coupling. Come up with an easy system that's kind of analogous to our complex system and give them the same random input. The next step is to answer the question for the easy system. That's pretty easy. Um, the uh, formula for the mean number of jobs in an MM1 is, uh, is standard. Um, so, so, the next, so the next big question, and this is kind of the heart of most coupling arguments, is how do we show that having the same random input implies similar answers? And I'm not going to walk through the whole argument, but I'm going to tell you the key idea. The key idea is that whenever the MMK has at least k jobs, then it's going to have exactly the same arrival and departure events as the MM1, right? The systems obviously have the same arrivals. Um, and while the MMK has at least k jobs, it turns out the MM1 will also always have at least one job in that case. And both systems will kind of be working at full capacity. So whenever a potential departure occurs, it'll occur in both systems. And so you can use that, and you can kind of work out the details to show that the mean number of jobs in the MMK is at most the mean number of jobs in an MM1 plus k minus 1. And so this is like, um, you know, obviously, it's not too hard to get a more precise answer for the MMK, but this is a very simple, elegant argument that gives a nice bound. And the kind of main idea with coupling is that in general, we're going to be working with like very complicated systems where we, where, you know, you can't just write down the Markov chain like you can for an MMK and solve it easily. And so this sort of coupling argument is the only path we'll have, or one of the only paths we'll have. So to kind of recap, the types of coupling arguments we're going to be looking at today are ones we're com comparing these two systems, a complex system and an easy system. And we're answering through this three-step pro answering a question for the complex system through the three-step process of look at a sy easy system with the same random input, answer for the easy system, and then um, show that due to the having the same random input, the easy answer is similar to the complex answer. And so, um, and what we're going to do is we're going to give an overview today of a whole bunch of different types of coupling. Um, or over today and tomorrow. We're going to give an overview of many different types of coupling. And we're going to kind of focus on sort of classify, or one, one theme will be classifying these different coupling arguments um, according to kind of different themes they show. And so there are kind of two main steps of most coupling arguments, and those are going to form the basis of our classification. So kind of taking a step back, I'm going to highlight two of the key steps. The first key step is you have to choose your easy system one. Right, and there's a bit of an art to this, right? Because you have to choose it to be like X, uh, you know, similar enough that you get, uh, you know, that you reasonably approximate X, but it's got to be easy enough that you can solve. And so, kind of one axis on which we'll one one thing theme we'll talk about is how do you come up with these easy systems? And then the uh, other big big question we're going to talk about is well, you have to then show that X and Y are close, right? You know, once you've chosen the easy system Y. And there's going to be a couple of different ways in which, um, in which we might show that two systems are close. So exactly what close means will be another way we can classify couplings. So here's the, what the classification is going to look like. It's going to, each axis is going to be one of these questions from the previous slide. How does y make x easier? Right? How did we come up with y? And then in what sense are x and y close? And so. Um, and so here, there are many, many ways you might think of coming up with a system Y that makes X easier. And we're going to focus on three broad themes in this talk. So the first one is you might, um, you might have a control problem, right? Your complex uh, system X might be a control problem where there's information that's hidden or unknown. And so one way to make the control problem easier might be to tell the controller more information, right? That might result in an easier problem. Um, another uh, another uh, possibility is maybe you're solving some uh, optimization problem with lots of complicated constraints, and you can make the problem easier by relaxing those constraints, either by getting rid of them entirely or by um, 
you know, a Lagrangian relaxation where you turn those constraints into costs. So you might have fewer constraints. And then finally, um, and this last category is admittedly a bit of a catch-all, um, you might uh, basically, if X is some stochastic process, you might make the stochastic process easier by just giving it simpler dynamics um, in some way. So an example might be a fluid approximation or a diffusion approximation, where you take some kind of uh, complicated dis uh, discrete stochastic process that you know has like a really, really big state space and summarize the state by like a real number and uh, look at fluid dynamics or diffusion uh, Brownian motion dynamics. So those are some ways in which y, y might make x easier. And, though, and we're going to look at kind of couplings of each of these three types. Um, we can also talk about different ways in which x and y are close. And the two main uh, ways we're going to categorize uh, these senses in which x and y are close are that in some cases, we're going to show that x and y are close on every sample path. So that is, um, you know, we've got some stochastic process. You know, we've defined the sample paths of that process. And we're kind of giving x and y the same, the same sample paths. And we're going to show that if you define sample path carefully enough, then x and y are always close in some sense. Um, um, there are going to be other examples of coupling um, where, where we actually don't necessarily have the x and y are close on every single sample path, but we're going to be able to show that their steady state distributions are still close when we give them the same uh, distribution of inputs. And so these kind of uh, these categories are going to form the basis of our coupling. So we're going to have couplings of type A1, meaning every sample, meaning that uh, we show that two systems are close on every sample path, where we got the easy system by giving the controller more information. Or we might have a coupling of type B3, where we make Y to be like an approximation of X, and we show that and it still has a similar steady state distribution. Um, so these are these are going to be the six types of couplings that we're going to talk about today. We're going to and we're going to see, I think, examples of all the types. So uh, so for instance, the coupling we saw a few slides ago about the MMK versus versus the MM1, that's an example of a type A2 coupling. Um, uh, at least that's the way I like to think of it. Because the way I like to think about the MMK is it's like an MM1, but where you're constrained to only be able to serve um, at capacity. Um, at capacity, the number of servers you have over k, um, if you've got few enough jobs. Um, and uh, the reason we can think of, um, if you're, we're going to talk more about kind of viewing the MMK or k server queues more generally as a constrained version of single server queues. We're going to talk about that more um, on day two tomorrow. So speaking of day two, let's let me give an overview of the rest of this tutorial. So um, our tutorial is divided into two parts, and each part is going to have a survey. Of, some, of a kind of a, uh, many examples of coupling. So in part one, we're going to do a survey of sample path coupling techniques. That is where uh, cases where we show, like the MMK versus the MM1, that two systems are close on every single sample path. Part two is going to focus on steady state couplings. And then for each part, we're also going to do an in-depth study of kind of one particular coupling, kind of diving into the details. So um, in, in part one, uh, Sid is going to talk about some work on online resource allocation and a particularly interesting sample path coupling that comes up there. And then in part two, I'm going to talk about uh, the Gittin scheduling policy in the MGK. Um, and we're going to talk more about kind of viewing single server queues and multi server queues as related, where the multi server is like constrained version of the single. Um, and we're going to get into that. So that's, so that's day one and day two. And so I think now we're going to pop. Um, for now, I think we're going to pause for questions, um, and then I'm going to hand it off to Sid for uh, for the survey and in-depth study for today. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So, in several of the examples you gave, um, we sort of had a guarantee that the simpler system would perform better than the worst system than the more complicated system. But if I wanted a lower bound instead of an upper bound, um, are there times when the same ideas would be applicable in reverse, like less info or that sort of thing? Yeah. So um, so the question is, these, these themes that we talked about, more information, fewer constraints, simpler dynamics, 
um, especially the first two, right, seem like they are, you know, if you're thinking about a control problem, they are beneficial for the controller. Um, the question is, can we apply techniques to get lower bounds as well? Um, so definitely when we get into, so there are going to be some examples here where we get lower bounds um, in this talk, um, but I think they are for uh, more stochastic process analyses than control problems. Um, Sid, do you have, do you know of yeah. examples where? Uh, I mean, yeah, so the one, we will sort of talk about one where we will get lower bounds, but yeah, as, as Ziv said, it's, it's for sort of performance analysis rather than for control. Um, they're definitely rarer. I mean, I know some, but I, I don't think I know a, a general technique which will give lower bounds. We will talk about one. Yeah, so you're right that we will uh, we'll actually talk about multiple things which will give natural upper bounds. But um, since we're talking about rewards, if it was cost, it would be lower bounds. But yeah, that's a fair question. I, I, I don't know of generic techniques for showing sort of hardness results in a certain sense using a coupling. I, I'm sure they exist, but yeah. All right, thanks. Um, do, we do we have a lower bound for the MMK example? Sure. So in the, well, in the MMK example, um, one, uh, one natural lower bound is to just use the MM1 as the example. So I guess, um, so actually, Here's maybe another a way to answer both that question and also shed more insight on Isaac's question. If we go back to the MMK example. So the result of this coupling argument, right? We compare it against a system that uh, kind of gives in, that made the system easier, right? So actually, Isaac, this is how I should have answered your question. So um, this system here kind of naturally makes the system easier, right, compared to the MMK. Easier in this case means better performance, um, lower, fewer jobs in the system. Um, but the result of our argument ended up being an upper bound, right? So we, so, um, so it's not too hard to show in this case that E of n one is a lower bound on E of n k, and then our coupling argument gave an upper bound on E of n k. So we ended up with a, we end up with kind of a sandwich where E n one is less than E n k is less than this. E n one plus k minus one, and so, um, and so. But you're, but it is true that I don't know of any examples where we kind of choose the easy system to be kind of worse um, in a natural way. Um, and so, and so yeah. So to answer the, que the question that was just asked, the lower bound for the MMK is just E n one, is a is one natural lower bound. And this is the performance analysis example that you meant, rather than a control problem. And so we're going to have one more. Yeah. Yes, it's going to do another later later today. In a few moments. Should we move on to the next? All right. Yeah. Let's, so I think uh, let, we're going to switch presenters. Yeah. Um, so I'll hand it over to Sid. I'm gonna go through quite a few couplings kind of fast, but at the end of that, happy to talk more about it. But uh, the plan is after this, we, like there's going to be like sort of video one point or video two, but then the I'll do one example in much more depth after this. All right, uh, I'm gonna start off. So, okay, so as I've said, the plan for in this part of the tutorial is to kind of do a quick survey over some sample path coupling techniques. Now, there are a huge number of these and there's no way to really do justice to all of these. So in some sense, this section really should be called something like a survey of some of my favorite sample path coupling techniques. Um, and before I even go there, I always like starting any sort of lecture about coupling with a, a shout out to the great Wolfgang Doblin. For any of you who don't know who Wolfgang Doblin is, um, please go and check out his Wikipedia page, read up on him. He's, he's, perhaps one of the, the most sort of underrated mathematicians in a certain sense. And, and there's a kind of unfortunate story here in that uh, a lot of the ideas that we'll talk about were 
developed by him when he was 21. Uh, but then he went off to fight the war and he never ended up doing anything else again. So, uh, and, and uncoupling is just like one of the many ideas that he came up with. So it's worthwhile kind of paying homage to him before jumping into our classification. So as we said, any such classification scheme, th this is not necessarily complete. We are trying to shoehorn some examples into some boxes, but in some sense we want to come like take all these idiosyncratic examples and look at some structure around them. And the one example we saw right now about the MMK versus the MM1, there was a sense of it involving lesser constraints. So we had a simpler system which had lesser constraints and that made it easier to analyze. So for the next example, um, we're gonna pay homage to the fact that the, the very reason we're even doing this tutorial over a video rather than meeting up in a room as well, we are stuck in an epidemic. Um, and this takes me back to one of perhaps my favorite papers in thinking about epidemic models and, and in particular the SIS epidemic model. So what exactly is the SIS model? Well, so the idea is that you have a, a social network connecting a bunch of people and each person has some infection level zero one. And really you should think of zero as being, as meaning that a person is susceptible to being infected and one means the person is actually infected. Uh, and in the SIS model, what happens is it's one of those infections which just keeps coming back over and over again. So you get infected, then you get healed at some rate mu, and then you may get infected again, and then you get healed again, and this process keeps going on. And, and the rate at which anybody gets infected is basically proportional to the, it's lambda times the number of infected neighbors that they have in the graph. So what happens in any SIS epidemic, if you think a bit about it, is that eventually the epidemic must die out. It, everyone becomes susceptible, that's the only absorbing state in this chain. So what is interesting is what you can try understanding is, well, how long does the epidemic take to actually die out? And uh, this sort of GIF is not completely clear, but what I'm sort of showing over here is two sample parts of the epidemic with very small differences in the parameter mu over lambda. Um, so in one case, it's slightly less than one, in the other case, it's slightly more than one. But if you look at the sample part, what seems to be happening on the right is that the epidemic seems to be spreading a lot, whereas on the left, it's not spreading as much. Um, and the reason why, at least applied probabilists, like thinking about epidemic models is it, it's one of the cleanest systems where you have this interesting sort of phase transition behavior where changing one parameter by a small amount has a drastic change in the performance of the system. And what we want to do is try to understand the problem, of course, is this is a pretty complex Markov chain. So we are trying to keep track of every person in a network, what their infection state is at any time in order to determine who else gets infected. Um, and this is way too complicated to sort of analyze in a closed form. Uh, and so this is where coupling is going to turn out to be helpful. And, and the two particular couplings I'm going to talk about are from this paper by Ganesh Masuri and Tausli um, from Infocom 2005. And the first thing they wanted to do was, well, we want to come up with a lower bound. So what's a lower bound on the time it takes for the infection to die out? And so we somehow want a system where the epidemic spreads less fast, but it, which is still easier to analyze. And the idea they said is, well, the real problem in the first model is that the network is difficult. Like we, we could understand this if maybe it was on a complete graph, but it's, it's just a mess to try to think about the network and what's happening on the network. So it would be nicer instead if we could just keep track of the number of infected people, not the exact set of infected people. The problem, of course, is the number alone does not seem to tell us who else is getting infected. Um, but for the moment, suppose we said that there were K people being infected. Um, what is still true is that the healing process is still simple um, because each person is getting healed at rate mu. Um, the total, if I have K people being infected, they're all getting healed at rate some mu times K. So up to now, these two sim systems are exactly the same. Um, and now here's sort of the simple idea in the coupling, which is, well, I want to somehow figure out what's the rate at which you go from K to K plus one infections. And I'm gonna say that it, this happens at some rate, lambda times some quantity of the graph. And the particular quantity that turns out to be important here is what's called the isobarometric constant of the graph. So what is this? Um, this is the sort of formal definition, but essentially it says, if you look at any K people who are infected, what's the set of susceptible neighbors that they have? 
um, what's the sort of smallest set of susceptible neighbors that any set of K infected people have? And if you think a bit about it, it's kind of clear that if you have any K people who are infected, they're all trying to, each person is trying to infect each of their neighbors at rate lambda. And since this is the sort of smallest boundary through which the infection is growing, um, this process is sort of, it's under dominating the true infection process. But the nice thing is now we have a birth death Markov chain. So we can actually analyze this in closed form. So in particular, if you give me a graph where I know something about this isobarometric constant of the graph, uh, now I have a very simple Markov chain which I can analyze and sort of figure out how long it takes. Uh, sorry, a, a quick question. Is sure. this minimum over vertex sets of size K or over all vertex sets? Um, so technically there should be minimum over vertex sets of size K where K is less than or equal to N over two, where N is the total number of vertices. But Okay, but it's not, dyna it's not dynamic. It's no, it's not dynamic. This is a fixed constant for the graph. All right, thanks. That's a fair question. Okay, so that's the sort of lower bound for the time it takes for the infection to die out. Um, it would be nice if we could somehow also get some sort of upper bound which is related to this. And there we have this sort of second amazing coupling which this paper come, uh, came up with, uh, which uses a completely different technique in order to do this. So now in order to get the upper bound, we actually keep the social network. This was the thing that we were worried about earlier that it was way too difficult, but now we actually want to sort of keep the network. Um, but we're gonna do this strange thing where we say that infections are no longer just zero one, but now the infection can take any sort of non-negative integer value. So you can be infected with infection value one or two. You can be very infected or very, very infected or very, very, very infected, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the assumption now is going to be that healing is no longer just at rate mu, but it's going to be at rate mu times i if the person has infection rate i. So earlier the infection was just zero and one, then healing is at rate mu. Now if you have an infection state of two, then you get healed at rate two mu and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, the infection process looks exactly the same. It's I time, or it's lambda times the total infection level of the neighbors, except now we are adding up these kind of integer values of the neighbor's infections. And at the moment, it's like, it, this. it's not at all obvious. Well, firstly, it's not obvious that this is going to give an upper bound. Um, if you think a bit about it, you can convince yourself that the infection state in the simpler model is actually always more than the infection state in the weaker model, if you just look at the total amount of infection. But remarkably, if you look at this process a little more, you'll actually notice that there's a quasi birth step mark of change. So by doing this weird transformation and converting everything into integers, you've actually made the process completely linear in a certain sense. Uh, and what Ganesh Masuri and Tausdi could do using this is basically show that the lower bound uh, it essentially depends on this bottleneck ratio, the isoperimetric constant of the graph. Whereas the upper bound, you sort of get a bound on mu over lambda, which depends on the largest eigenvalue of G's adjacency matrix. And this is beautiful because you can now take any network you want and you've basically got lower and upper bounds. Um, the upper bound is always more than the lower bound, but in many sort of graph families, these two are actually very close to each other. So here's an example where we wanted to try and understand the epidemic and we could actually understand it on both sides, both on the upper and lower side, but we needed completely different couplings in order to do this. So this in our classification is an example of a simpler dynamic. In fact, like both of these parts, we didn't really remove the constraints, but we somehow simplified the dynamics, but in completely different ways in order to get upper and lower bounds. Um, I'm gonna quickly walk us through a few more examples of, of these type 2a and type 3a couplings. Well, go, getting back to our queuing setting, um, here's another example from Gardner, Herkel Walter, and Shallow Wolf. And this is what's called a queue with redundancy. So, the one way of thinking about this is this is a checkout in, say, a supermarket. You have a bunch of cashiers who are all sort of serving customers. And then you have, you sort of show up with your card, but maybe you have your friend with you. And what you can do is, you can create multiple copies. So you can go to one of the checkout lines, your friend can go to some other checkout line and you stand in both of these lines. Um, 
So this kind of a model is called a queue with redundancy, where you're taking the same job and you're creating multiple copies of it at different servers. But in sort of network systems, um, there's this additional wrinkle which sometimes happens, which is that these servers can have random slowdowns. So they, each job has a fixed size. You have a fixed cart, which or uh, in a network system, you have a fixed job size, which is actually being worked upon. But, but these servers may slow down due to some other reason. Um, and what you want to understand is as we keep doing this kind of redundant queuing where we take the same job, create D copies, and then send them to say D random servers, um, how does the system behave? And if you think a little about the system, what's really happening over here is that by creating these redundant copies, well, you're removing the slowdown in the system. So even though one server may slow down since you're being served on some other server, overall you may get processed much faster. But by creating multiple copies, you may actually make the system unstable because you may have multiple servers working on the same job, kind of like duplicating the work. Um, and due to this, the system may actually kind of just start blowing up. And the interesting idea here is, well, we again want to come up with a coupling which relates this to an easier system. And the main idea is instead of looking at this kind of like making idle jobs which are sent to all of the idle servers, we're gonna instead look at a single server queue which has vacations. So what do we mean by this? Um, kind of at a very high level, the, the main idea is whenever we have the single server which is going idle, um, and it was working on a certain job, we actually don't create redundant copies of the job beforehand, but when the server goes idle, um, we actually take this job copy and, and then create, uh, oh, sorry, take the job and create copies of this. So you start a vacation process, and, and what you can show is the, even though the system is simpler, this actually gives an upper bound on the RIQ system, and you can use this to argue about the stability of the original RIQ system. So here's another example where we're not yet looking at control, but we are, we are looking at a slightly more uh, complicated performance measure, which is whether or not a system is stable under a certain policy. So finally, we're gonna start talking about control. So we've looked at this example of queues with redundancy. This again is arguably a system with simpler dynamics, but how can we use these coupling techniques when we actually wanna solve control problems? And for pretty much the rest of today's uh, for this talk, um, the, the system that I'm going to think a lot about is the stochastic online knapsack. So what exactly is the system? Um, this is exactly the knapsack problem, except that now all the jobs are not available beforehand and you just, you get to learn about the job values as you start processing the job. So you know, more formally, you have a knapsack. In this case, you have this big bag, which has the capacity for four jobs. And the first job has shown up and it says it has a value of V1 in this case, a value of 10. Now, you know that the other jobs have some distribution for their values, but you don't know the exact value. And we're assuming all jobs have unit size. So you can select up to B items. And so let's say we decided to select the first item. Well, now I have a capacity of three in my knapsack, but I've already earned a reward of 10. I get to see the new sort of job, uh, and we know that the value of this is four, and I need to decide whether or not to accept. So again, I'm, I have a fixed number of jobs T. Uh, each one has some random valuation. We know the distribution beforehand of what the values are. We can select at most B of these. And we want to maximize our reward. So maybe we rejected this item. We see the next one, that's a six. This keeps going. On. So how do we simplify this system? Now, it actually turns out there are many ways of doing it and it actually, it turns out to depend a lot on what sort of guarantee you want from the system. So I'm gonna talk about one technique very briefly and then one more in much more detail. And the simple the sort of, the first technique which I'll talk about in less detail is this idea of using what's called a weekly coupled relaxation. So if you think about the online knapsack, the difficulty in the online knapsack is that you have the knapsack. If you didn't have the knapsack, you would just accept all the jobs and get rewards from all of them. So what's really making the problem harder is that the knapsack is forcing you to make decisions. You, you need to decide whether or not to sort of accept a job or not. Um, so in a sense, it's sort of coupling together all your decisions over time. What would be nice if, uh, is if I could remove the knapsack and somehow make this problem completely separate. If I had 
like a series of decision problems which are not related to each other. So for example, what if instead of having a knapsack, I could somehow take each of the jobs and associate them with a cost and then say there is, you have no budget limit, you have no limit on how many items you accept, you just need to decide whether or not to accept an item. And this is in some sense a much easier problem. You just, an item comes in, it tells you, you know what value you have, you know what the cost of the item is. If value minus cost is positive, you should accept the item, else you don't accept the item. It's almost a trivial system. So what we'd somehow like to do is take the online knapsack and couple it to this kind of like an online purchasing system. And it turns out that there is actually a really simple way of doing this. Um, and this is using a form of what's called a Lagrangian relaxation. So the main idea is um, you can sort of take each of these incoming jobs and have a fixed cost for each of these. And then whenever you see, you don't know the job value, but whenever you see the value, as long as the value is more than this fixed cost lambda, you're gonna accept it, otherwise you don't accept it. So this is a sort of very simple form of like a threshold policy. But what you can show is that you can always choose a certain cost lambda, like given information about all the distributions of the, the values, um, such that if you just solve this online purchasing problem with this fixed lambda, then you get a two approximation. Now, how is this sort of a bound proved? Well, if you think a bit about it, the system on the right, um, where you are just sort of purchasing as long as things are bigger than lambda, you can convince yourself that this is always an upper bound, just using LP duality. Like using a fixed lambda is essentially using a, a the lambda is like a Lagrangian dual for this problem. And if I take any feasible Lagrangian dual, I will get an upper bound for the problem itself. What's a little more interesting is that there's a way of actually balancing your Lagrangian parameters such that you can, if you just use that, this well-chosen lambda, then you always get a half approximation. And the reason you're losing out is as you keep accepting things which are more than lambda, you may actually run out of budget. So what the coupling does at a high level is it basically argues that you don't, even though you run out of budget sometimes, and even though sometimes you actually have excess budget because you're not accepting everything, on average, you accept at least half, of, you get at least half the value of your upper bound. So you're using the simplest system to both give an upper bound, but also sort of couple to that upper bound. So this is a fairly general way of doing things. And we'll maybe even come back to this later on when we talk about steady state. Um, but it's still an example of what we do when we have fewer constraints. In this case, I've taken this, this constraint of the knapsack, removed it and said, you just have a huge pot of money. There's a price on each of these items, buy as many as you can. Um, what should be clear at this point is we've got four boxes unfilled. And so what I'm gonna next try to do is move into box 1A. And in order to do that, I'm gonna still think about the knapsack problem but I'm gonna make one small change in it where essentially I will just consider a bigger version of the problem. So what if the knapsack is much bigger and if we have way more items? So in particular, formally both B and T are large and maybe B is like some constant fraction of T. Now we have a two approximation for this case and you can think a bit about, well, would we be happy with the two approximation? And I'd argue you shouldn't. If you have a very large number of items showing up and you can take like 10% of all the items. Well, you should hope that your overall or like your overall value is clearly going to increase with T. And now if you're giving up half of the entire value, well, that means you have a regret which is growing linearly with T. So I am very much arguing that in this case, a two approximation is, is a glass half empty in a certain sense. You, you, if you have a huge amount of value, you're leaving half of that on the table. And so the natural question is, can we do better? If we, if we have a scenario like this, where we have a big online knapsack, is there a different way of coupling the system such that we can get regret, which is much smaller? And that's essentially going to be the, part, the theme of the next in-depth study where we will show a way of doing this, which actually works much, it's, it's a completely different way of coupling, which essentially uses more information about the process, but you end up getting much better bounds when you are trying to allocate many resources. So just to remind everyone, we, we want to sort of look at the stochastic online knapsack. And, and now I'm going to just put a few more numbers so that we can kind of talk about this in more detail. So 
So we have this very large knapsack, which we are trying to, and we have a bunch of T items which are arriving sequentially. Uh, we know that these have values V1, V2 to Vt. We don't know the value, but we know their distribution. We know the value of the current item which has arrived. So in this case, the first item has a value 20. Um, and for simplicity, let's assume that the values are actually IID and they just take three values. So it's either five, 10 or 20 with probability P5, P10 and P20. So in this problem, if you think a bit about it, well, anytime you see a item with value 20, you should clearly accept it. There's absolutely no point in rejecting a value 20. You're never getting anything higher. So the knapsack did a good job over here. Um, if you saw a value five, at least initially it feels like you should reject it, but there is some uncertainty about what, what do you do with the value 10? Does it make sense to accept it? Does it make sense to reject it? What's the right thing to do? So as we did before, we want to somehow come up with an easier system to look at. And the particular form of easier system that I'm gonna look at in this entire section is going to be what I call a profit benchmark. And the basic idea is this is a system which knows the future. It knows exactly what all the values are that are gonna show up, which basically means the system is not even an online problem, it's just an offline problem. It is already aware what all the values are that are going to show up in the future. It knows its knapsack size. It's just solving a so static knapsack problem in order to decide what to accept. And it's, it's quite clear this is an upper bound. Um, what is not clear at the moment is, well, okay, can you do anything interesting with this? Can you sort of come up with an interesting coupling using this benchmark? So let me walk you through this example to show you how we, how we do this coupling. So we have this online system where we see the first value, we don't see any of the other values. We know that eight values are going to show up. We have a capacity four, we need to decide what to do. Here's the offline system. It still has capacity four. It's also gonna get eight values, but it knows exactly who's showing up in the future. So I'm gonna come up, uh, make a few definitions here. So firstly, I'm gonna define this quantity R online. Uh, and this is going to the, the so parameter here is going to be the, the time slot t. So right now we are before time slot one. So I'm saying this is at time slot zero. Uh, and this is basically going to represent how much value has the online algorithm got up till now. So at time slot zero, the online algorithm hasn't got anything. It has zero value. I'll also define this weird quantity phi offline. Uh, this is going to take in two parameters. The first one, actually t minus t, this is the horizon, how much time is there still to go? And then the second one, bt, is the current budget that it has. So at, at the initial time, capital T is eight, so t minus t is also eight, since small t is zero, and the initial budget is four. And since this offline problem knows exactly what's coming in, it's gonna select these top four items. In this case, I've sort of highlighted these items in green, and if you add it up, you can see that it's phi offline, this, this function adds up to 70. So this is the value function of the offline problem, knowing everything in the future, starting off with some budget BT at, and with a horizon of T minus T to go. Now what's the online problem going to do? Well, at each time the online problem decides whether or not to accept. So maybe it decides to accept the first guy, takes the 10. So at this point, what happens is our online of one is becomes 10. It's already got a value of 10. The offline problem, well, it didn't really want to accept the 10 because it had a value of 70, which was obtained from these three 20s and the 10, which it was getting in the future. Uh, it initially wasn't thinking of accepting the 10, but it realizes if it accepts the 10, actually nothing changes. It still, it has a value of 10. And if it looks at the future problem with seven things to go and a capacity of three, the total future value is still 60. And what I've now done is I've taken these two online and offline problems and I've coupled them together so that they have exactly the same state. They've accepted the same number of things. But moreover, the sum of these two things is equal to the initial value of the offline problem. So online has got 10 units already in its bag. Um, offline knows that in the future, given its current capacity, it can get 60 more units. If you add it up, it, you get 70. So this is the type of coupling that we are trying to come up with where these two states are always coupled together. And somehow these two functions, the reward and the 
the reward that online has already got and the value of offline in the future sort of adds up to what the original value was. That would be ideal. If we could do that, we would know how to analyze it. Okay, what's the problem? Well, maybe at this time, offline realizes that V2 is equal to 10, and it decides to accept that as well. So what's happened now is offline's value has increased to 20. Uh, sorry, online's value has increased to 20. Um, the simpler offline system, well, it's trying to take the same action. So I'm forcing the states to be coupled, and so it's also accepted the 10. But at this point, it actually realizes that the future arrivals don't have enough value in order to sort of cover up its initial expectations. So it has only a capacity to, if it takes the best it can do from now onwards is to get 40 more, uh, a reward of 40. So even though the system state is coupled, uh, the sum of these two functions is now adding up to something which is less than what the initial promise was. So we're not exactly getting what we wanted from our system. But the idea now is, well, whatever is the, the difference between the two, I'm going to compensate offline for that difference. So I'm going to create this new extra variable in between, which I'm calling the compensation at time two, um, with the property that I still have this invariant that all three of these add up to the initial value of offline. And this is what I'm calling the compensated coupling. So what's going on over here is, the system states for the easy, the easy and hard system are always coupled. But moreover, um, the, the total reward that online has plus the total from the potential reward in the future of offline, um, these don't add up to the actual reward that offline wanted. But if I add the compensation term as well, then it sort of adds up to the original value. So kind of in a little more detail, all three of these, well, are all three of these quantities that I have in between, these are all random variables which depend on the sequence, um, even though offline is a deterministic function given the sequence. So offline knows exactly what it's doing given the sequence, but these quantities are random. And I'm gonna repeat this process. So this process keeps going on. I keep taking more and more values and at each time I may need to add more and more compensation. So in particular, if I sort of run the system till almost the last step, um, online has accepted a total value of 40, Offline has also accepted exactly the same set of things. Um, and the sum of all the compensations is still 10, and the sum of these three things still adds up to 70. Um, and then finally, this guy is going to take the last item. They both sort of fill up their knapsacks. The total online value is 60. Offline has no more value in the future because there's nothing showing up. Uh, the total sum of the compensations is 10, and this adds up to 70. Why is this process nice? Well. What have I done? I have basically shown that the difference between the future value of offline in the beginning and at the end of this coupled process is exactly equal to the total value that online got based on whatever decisions it took. I have no idea how it took these decisions, but it took a set of decisions, it got some value, and then at each stage, this compensation term basically made up for the rest. And Kind of combining this together, what, what's really happening here is that this compensation at each time t, well, this is online's, I, I look at the state where online has brought me up to now. So bt is exactly the state I reach at time t, just following whatever suggestions online gave. Um, but I look at the, the potential value that offline can get in the future starting from this state. And from this, I subtract the value that online is going to get in this current time span. So a few comments about what exactly is going on in this compensation process. Well, firstly, at a high level, what compensation is doing is it's, it's like a cost I'm providing to offline in order to convince this offline controller to follow online. I have a certain policy in mind. I'm stubborn about it. I don't know why I have, why I want to do this, but I, I want to follow it at any cost. And I'm willing to sort of pay the offline controller so that the offline controller is willing to go along with Somewhat more interestingly, um, these compensation terms don't actually depend on the trajectory up to now. They are sort of Markovian in the sense, if I tell you what's the current state of online, um, that completely determines the compensation term and, and whatever action online is about to take. I don't need to argue about how I reach there, what items I accepted, et cetera, et cetera. That doesn't matter. I have a certain state in my knapsack. That's the only thing 
which matters to determine the compensation. Uh, however, the future arrivals are incorporated and they're being incorporated by the fact that offline is aware of these future arrivals. You know, formally, this compensation, this term comp T, this is actually a random variable which depends on the future trajectory. Okay, so up to now, I haven't really done much. This is just bookkeeping. I have kind of taken this process, come up with a coupling where I couple the states together and I define this compensation to sort of couple the value functions together as well. Uh, what I really want to understand is, okay, when do we compensate and how do we sort of calculate this compensation quantity? So let's look at the same example. Uh, we have uh, each of these values and now the first guy, the the knapsack is deciding whether or not, or the online algorithm is deciding whether or not to accept V2. And I claim that if online wants to accept V2, like if the true policy was that, yes, we should accept this value, then we needed to compensate, if and only if, at least three of the future arrivals have value 20. The only way we make a mistake by taking a 10 is if there were enough 20s in the future to fill up your knapsack. Otherwise, we never compensate. Similarly, if I wanted to reject V2, the only way that would happen is at most two of the future arrivals have values which are in 10 and 20. So in words, the only reason for feeling bad about rejecting a 10 is if this was the only 10 which would have sort of given me the maximum value or like the total number of values which are either 10 or 20 in the future, including today's value is at most three. And why is this nice? Once I have these two events, I actually know exactly what the probabilities are. So in first case, I have like six more arrivals in the future. I already know the first one is a 10. I have six arrivals. I know the probability is P20. So I'm, I'm asking whether a binomial with of six comma P20 is greater than or equal to three. In the second case, I'm asking whether a binomial of six comma P20 plus P10 is less than or equal to two. And this actually now, so up to now, I've been completely agnostic about what my policy is. But now that I have a sense of how to bound these compensations, this kind of immediately gives rise to a very natural policy, which is, well, choose the one where you have the least compensation. So I've computed this the compensation at each time. I mean, yes, it's a random variable, so I, I should say choose the action with the least expected compensation. Um, but I can exactly calculate that using this sort of analysis. And this now gives this, this idea of the base selector, which is what if I just kind of follow the action with has the least expected compensation? Um, and what you can show is that for the online knapsack, if you have a finite set of types, if you have a finite set of values which are showing up, then this policy has a regret which scales with the number of types, um, but it's actually completely independent of the budget and the time horizon. So no matter how big the budget is and no matter how big your time horizon is, the sort of simple idea of just calculating the compensations, trying to find out the minimum expected compensation and then just following that um, actually gives you a regret, which is a constant. So in particular, if you wanted to think of this as a competitive ratio, the competitive ratio is one minus Epsilon where epsilon, one minus a small O of t. In short, much better than the factor half. So here's a completely different way of doing the coupling for exactly the same problem. But what it is giving is in, in this version of the problem where I have a much larger knapsack, uh, I actually get bounds which are much stronger and I get a, a completely different type of control policy, this base selector policy, which has much better performance. Now, proving this particular fact about a finite set of values, uh, it's not that difficult if you kind of go through the previous argument we had and, sorry, if you sort of actually think about these probabilities and then do a bunch of concentrations, you can do it, but it's a little bit tedious. Um, but in order to sort of show you how this argument is done, I'll actually look at another case which even though it initially seems like it should be hard, it's surprisingly easy. So this is the case where instead of assuming that I have a finite set of values, um, I'm now gonna think of each of these values as being uniform in zero one. So every value, so every knapsack has a IID value which is uniform zero one, and it, uh, 
uh, sorry, every incoming item and it takes up capacity one. And the style of policy I'm going to think of is at time t, um, I want the policy is going to accept any value which is more than some theta. And we'll try to choose the theta late. So it's some threshold. If you're bigger than the threshold, I accept the item. Otherwise, I don't accept the item. And I now want to do the same kind of compensation argument to see how well I do in this case. So to do this, I need one other definition, which is, well, if the remaining horizon is h, so t minus t is equal to h, um, I'm going to define this quantity v superscript h subscript b as being the bth largest value in the future arrivals. So if you were the prophet and you knew all of the arrivals coming in the future, um, this is something which is available to you. You can just sort of look at these and calculate what this is. And pictorially, what is going on is um, you have values which are showing up in 0 to 1, and you have this quantity VHP. Um, and as the offline controller, you know where this is. Now, suppose the online controller chooses a theta, which just happens to be less than VHP. At the moment, the online controller does not know what VHP is, but for a moment, let's suppose that theta was smaller. We want to think about what the compensations are. And to do that, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to now try and see where Vt, the, the current value, is actually falling. So firstly, if the current value turned out to be less than this chosen theta, I claim we are actually fine. We don't need to compensate. And the reason for that is, well, this VHB, the bth largest value of the future samples, um, this is sort of like the marginal threshold for the offline algorithm. It's, it's the smallest value that it's getting in the future. And so it's only willing to accept the current guy if it was more than VHP. In this case, the current VT is less than VHP, but it's also less than theta. So both online and offline are rejecting this. There's no compensation. You can do the same argument for if the value was bigger than VHP. Both online and offline are willing to accept this value. There's still no compensation. And so the only interesting case is when it falls in between, when I would have to compensate. But just looking at this picture, you can convince yourself that the compensation is exactly going to be the difference between these two. So it's looking at the current value. If I accept the current value, I am accepting it because it's more than theta. That means I'm sort of rejecting the be it smallest value in the future, or sorry, be it largest value in the future. And the amount I need to pay offline in order to do that is the distance between these two. And this is nice because I can kind of write this more formally. So in particular, what I'm claiming is that the compensation at time t is actually, it's the difference between this VHB and VT um, times the indicator that VT is actually falling in this in-between interval. Now, I only argued the case where theta was late, less than VHB, but you can try and convince yourself that if theta was more than VHB, you would still get the same thing. It just sort of, it's the mirror image of this picture. So really what I can say is that the compensation at time t is the absolute difference between VHB and VT times the indicator that VT exactly fell in the center. I still haven't chosen theta, so I still haven't decided what my policy is. But at this point, what I can do is I can just take expectation on both sides. And I can take this sort of expectation by conditioning it first on the current arrival VT and then on this sort of future bth maximum, this VHB quantity. Now, if you stare a bit at this inner thing, I'm, I'm looking at the absolute distance between VHB and VT in this interval. Um, just using sort of simple geometry, you can convince yourself that this is going to be the length of the interval squared divided by two. This is just the area of a triangle. Um, so the triangle is it's zero at VHB itself, and it goes all the way up to VHB minus theta at theta. And once you see this, well, it's kind of clear what you want theta to be. If you want to minimize this expectation, well, you choose theta to be the expected value of VHP. And if you do that, you get that this compensation term is less than equal to the variance of this order statistic in the future. Um, and this is nice because VHB for a uniform, this is just the bth largest value out of capital of out of H uniform. So it's it's the bth order statistic of a uniform. Um, and now you can just go to Wikipedia and look at all the statistics of the uniform. We know it in complete closed form. So it turns out to be a beta distribution. People have calculated everything about it. So in particular, Wikipedia tells us that the variance is at most one over, it's some constant over h, something like constant over h minus b over h squared. 
it doesn't matter because at this point, I've actually got a bound for my compensation, which is independent of the state. So no matter what my current state is, no matter what my budget is, I'm able to argue that the compensation is never more than some constant over the horizon to go. And since, I'm, since my regret is just the sum of each of these compensation terms, what we immediately get is that the regret is at most lofty. So surprisingly, even though we knew how to analyze the, the finite case before, um, for some reason, this analysis was not known even for a while. Um, and the first time I saw it was in this paper by Rob Bray, where he basically proves that the uniform, like the this online knapsack with uniform arrivals has a regret, which is at most lofty, but you can also kind of do a more complicated argument, uh, actually not involve, well, not involving a compensated coupling, but using a different type of coupling to show a lower bound, which shows that it has to be at least lofty as well. And so we completely understand what the regret is for the multi secretary And in fact, you can generalize this argument in a fairly straightforward way to show that for like any regular distribution, the regret is at most and at least lofty. There's one other small interesting bit about this, which is I actually didn't even need theta to be exactly the expectation. You can also convince yourself that even if you just take a constant theta up front, um, you'll still get, uh, or you take a theta which like, uh, okay, there are many other choices of theta which would still get you the log. So somehow the, the continuous case is surprisingly much easier than the discrete case, which is one of the weird thing over here. Sorry, there was a question. Oh, sorry. I, maybe I missed yes. this, but what are we choosing theta to be? Like, I don't see how we do that last step where we- Yeah, so um, since uh, there's a by two missing, um, but since I'm looking at some random variable minus theta squared, uh, that is bounded by the variance of that random variable. So if I choose theta to be the expected value of, of this VHB random variable, I'll just get the variance. Uh, but, oh, because H and B are both known to us. Okay. Yes. Okay, exactly. I didn't realize we were choosing a variable theta. Okay. So yeah, uh, I, I should have made this more clear. So. Till the last step, I actually hadn't specified the policy, but the policy just turns out to be the sort of natural base selector here, which is choose the expected value of this marginal. And that works, but but actually, I mean, if you stare at this a bit, you can convince yourself that the many choices of theta, which would get you the same lofty regret. So this problem, even though it seems harder, is surprisingly easy once you sort of go through this coupling. Um, what I mean by it being surprisingly easy is that, uh, this problem is, okay, so maybe I'll come back to this question in a little bit, but um, this turns out to be slightly harder for the case where you have a, a finite set of types. Um, so the earlier result I showed about the finite base selector is weirdly enough trickier, even though the distribution seems simpler. And like obvious things are not gonna get you a constant regret here, whereas kind of obvious policies here will get you the optimal lofty regret. Okay, so Sid? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Maybe a, yeah, so how would you interpret that the kind of analysis for the uniform case as far as saying something about the near optimality of rank based policies, but for the original problem where of course there's there's ties because it's mostly ties, but still there would be a difference between saying, well, jobs can be like size one, two, and three. And all I know is that the job I'm looking at is somehow exactly in the middle of the remaining jobs. That That is less information, presumably, than knowing exactly what their values are. Does I, I agree. Um, I think my weak answer, so what you're saying about the, so formally the thing that you're saying about the tie breaking is the hard part. Like you have a lot of ties in the case where you have a discrete set of types and doing the right thing when you have ties is tricky, but I think, so the informal way I think of this is, this is almost like a smoothed complexity sort of idea that somehow when you smooth the problem, it turns out to be easier. So there's not, at a very high level, that's really what's going on over here. By smoothing the problem out, you're not having as many strange corner cases which trip you up. I, I guess I was trying to get something else. Let me, let me ask a, a more, but it was a little vague. Let me ask a very specific question for the uniform case. 
so the analysis that you gave for the uniform case presumably shows that given that there are no ties, there is a rank-based online strategy that has logarithmic regret. As, as compared, yes. or do you believe that if we just look at the online policies, so here's two different classes of online policies. One is all online policies that are legit, adapted, allowed. Right. The other is online policies that can only use the, you know, the rank information. Um, do you suspect the gap there is logarithmic or do you um, think it's really a constant because it's like super so concentrated? Maybe this comes back to Isaac's question that the thing, I am hiding a little bit how to choose theta and it is, it's somewhat crucial that theta depends on H and B. So literally choosing, okay, I should be careful about that. Uh, I actually think in fact, choosing a constant threshold may also get you a log T here. Like literally not even changing the threshold over time. Um, I think that also does get you log T. So, right, sorry, then I'll take back my statement. So yeah, it, this, not only is it a rank-based policy, it's, it's literally a fixed threshold policy here, will get you log T, but it won't get you the optimal constant. Um, so. But when I, I, why is theta even necessary in the sense of, okay, so let's say theta is needed for the proof. In the statement of the results, can you concretely state that a rank-based online policy gets you constant additive, gets you logarithmic additive regret relative to the best offline? Yes, uh, it's not obvious from this, but uh, I'm interpreting rank-based as independent of H and B, only dependent on V. And yes, that is true by essentially the same analysis. Um, so the statement of the result doesn't need a theta in it is what I'm trying to uh, say. You need to choose some theta, but there are sort of, there's just a constant theta independent of B and H, which I think gets you the log T. You're definitely editing this out because I'm not 100% about it. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll take it offline. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, no, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty I'm sure this is true. I'm a little confused myself, so, I think. Okay, yeah, but, fair uh, enough, fair enough. Okay, so, so this was the uniform. So in the sort of last few minutes of the tutorial, what I want to do uh, of this part of the tutorial is I want to sort of, generalize this idea of the compensated coupling and you know, tell you a little bit more about like what else we've been able to do with this. So the kind of what's going on and throughout underneath all the examples I gave you is that the offline system that we are looking at is the online system, but with a richer filtration. So it's an online system, but with some information about who is showing up in the future. Um, and what I'm going to do in the next slide, just to keep things sort of notationally less heavy, is I'll always use the, the teal colored symbols to denote quantities which are measured with respect to the GT filtration, so adapted with GT, whereas anything in orange is going to be adapted to the natural filtration, and in particular, ST and AT will always be the state and action taken by the online policy, any online policy that we're using um, for this process. So, what the compensated coupling is doing is just this simple argument that I'm gonna show over here, which is at time one, we always start off with state S1, both offline and online. Um, and offline's value function given the future is equal to the reward at time step one, if it takes some action A1 as specified by online, plus the offline value function at time step two with state being S2 as according to online, plus a compensation term. So offline may not be wanting to take A1, I force offline to take A1 and I compensate offline for that. At time step two, offline may not want to take A2, hard luck, you have to take A2, I compensate you for that. And I keep doing this at every time. And at the end, well, I just have a simple telescoping sum. So I'm gonna just cancel out the fee offlines on both sides actually. Before that, if you look at this quantity here, this reward of S1A1 plus fee offline of S2, so any of you who've seen more like Markov decision processes before, this is what's called the Q function of offline um, at state S1 based on taking action A1 and so on and so forth. But if I just add all of this up, what I'm getting is that offline's initial value function at the initial state is the sum of each of these rewards at time t at state st taking action at plus the sum of each of these compensations. I've just sort of canceled out the fee offline, but the sum of these rewards 
is the total reward that the online algorithm realizes because offline was exactly following what online was doing. And so what we're getting is that the regret for any online policy compared to this hindsight benchmark or any benchmark which has sort of more information about the future is exactly equal to the sum of these compensation terms. So at each time, if I can calculate what the compensation is, I can just add it all up and I'm going to get the regret for any policy that I want. And what you can do with this is once you have a relation like this, you can sort of start analyzing different policies and different systems. So amongst other things, I'll give you sort of two examples of things that we've done in the past with this. So firstly, instead of looking at just online knapsack, we can look at what's called the network revenue management system. So what happens here is instead of just having one knapsack, you can think of uh, this as having deep separate knapsacks or uh, one good example of this is like the D, like flights which are taking off on a certain day and people want to take sort of multi-hop flights. If I want to go from here to Pittsburgh to visit Ziv, well, unfortunately, there's no direct flight. I'm going to go to Detroit first and then maybe go to Pittsburgh. So I need one, one seat on each of these flights. So this is a sort of more general version of what's called an online parking problem. And what you can show is using exactly sort of similar arguments that there is a policy, in particular the base selector policy, which has a regret, which is linear in the number of resources, but totally independent of all the budgets and independent of the number of arrivals, which are showing up. And, and this genuinely works in practice. If you compare it to you know, existing state-of-the-art policies using kind of like model predictive control, um, you get a constant reward, whereas all the existing ones have typically a square root D reward, which is usually the kind of heavy traffic control limits in this case. Um, a problem perhaps closer to the symmetrics audience is online bin packing. So what if I have like jobs coming to a virtual machine and these jobs have like certain requirements of uh, to, a, to a cloud server and the jobs require certain, um, they have certain like memory and uh, processing requirements and you have a bunch of like virtual machines with some memory and processing and you can take each of these jobs and sort of put them each into these bins and you want to create the minimum number of like real machines over time. So as these jobs keep coming in, you want to minimize the number of like machines that you create and you can't remove a job once you assign it to a bin. Um, so this is a version of online bin packing. It's a very classical problem in, in operations research. Um, what was known about this before is that in general, we couldn't do better than sort of a square root T regret. But again, if you use this form of the, uh, the base selector, there is a policy which has regret, which is at most a constant. Um, and there are actually many other cases where this, these kind of ideas turn out to be useful. Okay, so, so with this, I'm gonna sort of conclude this part of the in-depth part of the tutorial. Um, so what I've talked about is uh, a one coupling where again, it's a sample path coupling, but I'm using more information about the future to create the easier system. And I'm using this idea of the compensated coupling to actually bond the two systems. So the plan, the thing that is clearly left in this table is this whole of column two. Uh, and for that, I, we hope you are gonna join us tomorrow, where Ziv is gonna tell us about how we use these techniques to analyze steady state distributions.